Greetings and welcome to another edition of Montpelier Connection. I'm State Representative Mike Merwicki from the Wyndham Four District of Putney, Dummerson, Westminster, and we have just concluded an election season. It's getting to the end of the year, which means the new year is coming and a new legislative session. To talk about, we have Representative Tristan Tolino here. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Uh, it was an interesting election nationwide. Uh, in many cases, I think the Democratic performance uh, met the expectations. I don't think many people assumed the Senate was going to turn, given the conditions in, in, on the national scene for mm -hmm. where those Senate seats were, but the 40 pickups in the House were good. Mm -hmm. Here in Vermont, uh, we picked up uh, 12 seats. Democrats did? Um, you know, I should know that answer right off the top of my head. Yes, 12. Yeah, I think if we I went do the math, eight, we went 83 to, to 95. To 95. And uh, one of the things we, we were just talking about is uh, what a, a broad spectrum it is for Democrats. We have a spectrum of people who are mm -hmm. pretty darn conservative, a lot of people moderate to the left and the progressive side. So it's holding that together is something that you well know about being in leadership, and uh, we'll have our challenges. but. Looking at the election, uh, we did pretty well. Uh, it was a lot of hard work and did that, but what are your other insights? What were the sure. drivers here? Yeah, thank you, Mike. And let me just uh, introduce myself to the members of the public. Uh, I am one of the three members uh, who serve the Brattleboro community. I represent the third district, which is uh, roughly one third of Brattleboro's uh, geography. Uh, for those of you who know Brattleboro well, it's um, most of the downtown and north to the Dummerston town line and west over to just a little bit past the highway. And I also serve as the assistant majority leader uh, for the House Democratic Caucus. And so some of the context for Mike's questions are related to the role that, that I play as part of our political leadership team within the House. And uh, so let me pivot to those uh, questions and see, uh, you know, I think there, there are a variety of different things, certainly from the, the Democratic Party perspective, there was a lot to like uh, about this election cycle um, at the national level to have made gains in at least one body in Congress, I think brings some balance and some opportunity for uh, conversations about um, accountability, but also conversations about uh, negotiations, I guess I would say, for, for more moderate outcomes uh, than is, has been currently uh, true under a, a Congress totally controlled by Republicans. Um, in, in Vermont, uh, we did see a pretty significant shift in the Vermont House. Um, we have gone from a body with 53 Republicans and a couple of quite, uh, conservative independents to, I think, a net of 43 Republicans and uh, a couple fewer independents, uh, and as you mentioned, a, a gain of 12 Democrats. Um, I will caution people, just you may have seen a headline that the House wins a veto-proof majority and all of this uh, not similar so language. Not yeah, similar language, and I think that that speaks to the point that you were raising about the Big Tent, and the reality is that we, uh, while we have 95 Democrats and there are seven progressives, uh, the range of, of political thinking within that group of 102 is pretty significant. And uh, it, in order to override a potential veto of a governor, uh, the House has to have 100 votes to override, two-thirds of the body. And, and so that's why that number has been very, uh, very prominently discussed. Uh, and, and also in part because this current governor who just was reelected uh, relatively easily uh, to his second term uh, has uh, probably the most active veto uh, behavior of any governor. 13 last year? Yeah, I think it was 13 last year or 14 overall. And, and um, uh, you know, one of the very few who's vetoed a budget. Um, so you know, he's been a very active, uh, he's very, been very active in utilizing the tool that the governor has of trying to shape the agenda of public policy in Vermont through the veto. And so having the potential to override a veto uh, puts us into a different, a different position in terms of uh, hopefully negotiating more uh, as a sort of as a way of getting to an end game on, on certain policy issues. And, uh, again, for people who may or may not have 
paid as much attention. Uh, the last session in particular, uh, we went extremely late in the session. Uh, yeah. We went until the last week in June before finding out that the governor would let the final version of the budget become law. And Vermont was on the precipice of a government shutdown that um, has never happened before. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I actually think that there is a situation where, where the numbers would have made a difference um, because had we worked with people to, to be clear that we could override yeah. a veto, then there would have been more incentive for him to negotiate. And instead there was, uh, you know, he saw it as, a, as an opportunity to use the veto power uh, to try to force change. And ultimately there was very little change forced, um, but it put Vermont in a, in a precarious position, very atypical with our history as a uh, quite uh, pragmatic on on fiscal issues throughout yeah. Vermont history. Yeah, uh, do you think this may help move uh, relations differently? And in another area, uh, have both the governor and the administration be more present in the legislature? One of the things we noticed in the last session that uh, the administration was not very present in the mm -hmm. legislature in committees or building relationships and negotiations and were kind of late to the table when they did have ideas. Well, so I certainly hope so. And, uh, and for context, again, to help uh, those who, who may not be attuned to this, uh, Vermont has an incredible political system. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, we talk a lot about town meeting, but maybe people don't n realize quite how connected their local legislators are uh, to the home communities and how intimate and open the processes of making law in Vermont. And uh, with 150 House members who uh, in, live and, and represent small, relatively small chunks of the population, there's great connection there. The State House is a very open process. If you come up to visit us, first off, you may see people from all over the state that you know, um, but you can come and sit and listen in in committee. You can um, come up and talk to us in the halls. We're not professional politicians. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're there doing the people's work. And that intimacy and that connection to the people's work is so powerful. And, and one of the ways that historically had that that relationship with the administration has worked in this context is that the administration uh, leadership teams uh, from different agencies and departments are very present during the lawmaking process and and are actively trying to shape uh, the agenda from their perspective and so typically you know if, if it's a Republican administration and democratic controlled bodies you know, th they're not necessarily going to be total alignment on the issues uh, but as the policy is worked through in many cases with good information uh, the legislators can shape the policy to be more in line with something that's going to avoid a potential veto threat. And what we heard many times, uh, last year in particular, was we're not going to give you that feedback now. When you are done doing your work, you send it to us, we'll review it, and we'll decide whether we think it's good enough. And, and that's really, um, I think, without modern precedent as well. And, and I. Uh, I'm not sure if it's ev that if it's ever been true of Vermont politics, and I think it's a shame. And so, if the shift in numbers and the re-election and having survived his first re-election, if those things can contribute to the administration showing up in a different way, I think it would be good for everybody. We actually can and do talk about things that we disagree on, yep. and we're you know we understand that that Vermonters elect a governor to have influence in the process as well and to provide a check and balance against, you know, the perhaps the, you know, the way that the legislature can kind of get all excited about a, a problem in a particular way, you know, the governor can have a different perspective. That's yeah. healthy and that's part of democracy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned before doing the people's work and and I agree that in Vermont government is as much as any in state government in the nation, we, we are following uh, Lincoln's edict mm -hmm. that uh, we are government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And uh, people do have access to government mm -hmm. here. Uh, we're responsive mm -hmm. and uh, working together, w whatever party, and this is unprecedented. So I hope, I hope this changes in the next election. We can uh, get our work done quicker and, and not stay till, till June and July. Uh, 
couple of things rose up in the last election. Uh, <clears throat> I think the economy is on the minds of a lot of people. Uh, but I think especially uh, what we're noticing statewide and, and nationwide is uh, the president's talk of an economic boom does not resonate with most people because it hasn't touched the middle class. And one of the things we're trying to work towards is an economy that works for all, not just a select few. Mm -hmm. And uh, we tried to pass a few things last year that would help families and, and kids. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what are we going to be looking at again this year in the realm of yeah, so, moving the economy forward for everybody? Right. And so two of those large um, you know, attention gathering <laughs> bills that the governor vetoed last year, minimum wage and uh, a paid family leave insurance program. Uh, both of those are likely to come back up again. And, and I want to speak to the paid family leave actually, as an, um, because what, what we passed and sent to the governor was something that was funded by employees uh, for their own benefit and protection. And it would have allowed everybody to access uh, a modest benefit uh, that would allow them to take care of a sick, el you know, parent, or you know, if you have a long-term uh, crisis at home, to take a couple weeks, you know, to actually recover from, or surgery things, you know, things that, frankly, that that everybody experiences, and and the rest of the world does too. The, We're one right, of the few the, and the rest of the world has addressed this uh, in a much more universal way, and you know, in in Vermont in the Vermont economy. Um, there are substantial pockets of people who don't have access to that kind of benefit through work. And um, frankly, the, the people who do have it through work know full well as in whether they're the, on the, um, sort of the, the power side of the employee, employer relationship or whether they work for somebody who offers it. You know, th they know that this is a meaningful benefit that can really help people. Uh, and what it does is it, it just takes a huge amount of stress off of people to know that there's a little bit of a safety net, a financial safety net that allows them to be human and uh, breathe to a take, little easier. And breathe a little easier and take care of each other. Yeah. And uh, I, I think it was stunning to me that the governor vetoed it uh, because it was self-funded. It didn't even require yeah. uh, anything from the employers. Uh, so that was a huge disappointment. I know that there will be uh, quite a bit of momentum there. Uh, minimum wage will continue to be an issue, and I think um, the, there's sort of conflicting information out there about what's happening within the economy and whether or not um, the wage increase uh, because of the pressure of not having enough people in the workforce is starting to get ahead of where our minimum wage is. Um, but minimum wage, it, if it, fundamentally, it's really about making sure it's a level playing field for, for workers and that, the, and that getting into the workforce, you're gonna get in at a place where uh, you have a chance to make it uh, without a significant amount of, of state or federal subsidies in order to close the gap. And, and what we have done around the country, and Vermont is better than most states, but around the country where we fail to protect workers is that we have agreed to subsidize the, uh, the business community uh, for their low cost labor because we make up the gap in public services. And if we paid truly living wages or so, you know, a much fairer wage across the board, we would not need to provide so many services to provide peace of people with basic dignity and basic protections. Uh, you know, that, that whole side, we call it the human services part of the state budgets, you know, the, uh, and the federal budget, that whole human services support system is in many cases propping up uh, a labor market that's built on on a cheap labor, a fake cheap labor. Yeah. Yep. Um, a little sidestep, um, what could be another avenue of the economy. Uh, many of us in Vermont are, are rightfully concerned about the climate chaos mm -hmm. that we're experiencing, the, the changing climate due to global mm -hmm. warming and how we're experiencing that now. Um, is that going to be on our agenda? And, and as some people say there are economic opportunities mm -hmm. in the energy field and conservation that that can work hand in hand with climate action. I think there's no question that it will be on the agenda. Um, you know, there are ways in which uh, the politics of this particular issue can can be difficult to navigate. And and you know, I, I'm going to bring back 
uh, the conversation briefly to the governor and say that, that when this governor ran for his first term and, uh, and, and then again this time, he received tremendous financial support from out-of-state interests, including the Koch brothers and others who um, have massive wealth from the oil industry and have used it to influence who's elected and why. And there was a real vilification of, uh, of an idea around carbon pricing, and, and I don't even want to name it by name because it was uh, built on lies. And just say that that we know we know that we need to address climate. We know that the political environment is being shaped by, and even in Vermont, by substantial investments of out-of-state dollars from corporate interests who do not care about our environment. They don't care if we're gonna be sugaring in January. They don't care if the snowmobiling industry fails because of the lack of snow. They don't care if the ski industry collapse or if the orchards uh, collapse because spring the comes health early. Concerns that are rising up now. Or, and yeah, and the pollution and the health, yeah. you know, all of those things. That's not what motivates the flow of money. And, and they're spending money in Vermont and a lot of it. And uh, so we know we need to be strong against that that outside influence and strong on um, a vision of, of a healthy Vermont for all. Uh, and that in order to do that, we have to possibly make some decisions about how we make uh, carbon pollution more expensive and how we make sure that in doing so, we make the things that we know are gonna be healthier for the environment and healthy for humans cheaper. And so it's it's not just simply make everything more expensive, but actually make the bad thing more expensive and the good thing cheaper. Yeah, yeah. And therein lies the opportunity. I think one of the challenges for us, as much as that other political influence, is to make sure um, we keep it progressive. Mm -hmm. I, I think this could also be part of a bigger, comprehensive tax reform mm -hmm. that we're talking about, whether it's how we fund education, uh, where does the income tax fall into that? What are property taxes? And, and uh, can our gas taxes continue to provide enough to maintain the roads and bridges as we, as we need them? So those are some of the challenges we're, we're facing going forward. Yeah. Um, agriculture certainly mm -hmm. has its challenges and some of it from the changes of, of climate. But uh, you have been on agricultural committee uh, at various times. Uh, is there anything you're hearing or, or seeing that you think we should be looking at? Yeah, actually, we're going through in Vermont right now probably the biggest uh, change in the Vermont agricultural economy uh, in our lifetimes, if not longer. Uh, the uh, last couple years of the commer sort of large-scale commercial dairy markets uh, have been uh, a brutal uh, economy for farmers to thrive in. The data point that I heard two weeks ago uh, from somebody from connected to the Agency of Agriculture uh, Research was 75% uh, of Vermont dairy farms are right now producing milk above the cost that they get paid. And uh, that, that simply means that the, the collapse of this market uh, the number of farmers who can afford to lose money year after year, you know, is very small. And so we're we're heading for a world where there are probably fewer than a thousand uh, dairy farms of any size in the state. Uh, I think even a decade ago it was something close to three thousand. So it's a pretty significant change. We're producing as much fluid milk as we have mm -hmm. before. So we, and this is one of the dynamics that's causing the, the drop in prices and also the national and international appetite for milk and dairy products has changed. Yeah. Uh, and what I guess I would say that that's the, the, the real shift that's happening, but the real opportunity is in value added agriculture. We, uh, as you know, many people no doubt know, Vermont is an uh, international leader in cheese making. Um, that's a value-added agricultural enterprise that, that can be smaller scale and still be profitable. Um, we're doing really well in the beer market, in the craft beer industry. Uh, there's uh, been tremendous growth in uh, all kinds of different little pockets of the specialty food sector. Vermont is too small uh, to be 
Um, in the long run, a major player in commodity markets, we need to be in the, the niches, in the art artisanal sides of, yeah. of the ag and, and value-added economy. And um, I, I would say that we have a pretty substantial uh, amount of work to do on the policy side to support that transformation of our economy, yeah. of the ag economy. And hopefully we'll take that on this year. Yeah. Now, I, I understand Congress uh, has either just passed or is close to passing the farm bill. Mm -hmm. um, are you aware of any help for the dairy industry in there? Uh, I think that there may be a little bit, but it's this is a big structural problem, and uh, the I don't know whether it's the dairy industry is specifically caught up in the tariff issue as well, but mm -hmm. certainly one of the growth parts of the international market that protected uh, the dairy industry for a while was selling to the Chinese market in uh, dried milk uh, products and that has uh, definitely declined over the last few years so it's it's all tied in um, and the farm bill is the ultimate uh, sort of um, sausage making uh, kind of bill in Congress. It's taken them, I think, five years to find a way to reauthorize mm -hmm. this bill. And they have had brutal fights about quite a range of things within it. And uh, so it's hard to know what will actually <laughs> make it through to the finish line. Yeah. Um, another thing that uh, has been on uh, the landscape is, is changing demographics in Vermont and, and how um, the reputation that Vermont has gotten as the whitest mm -hmm. state in the nation uh, can almost make it seem like it's an unwelcome place for people of color. Uh, one of our colleagues had mm -hmm. the horrible experience of being harassed to the point that she resigned from the legislature. Um, in local conversations, a number of people I've talked to have said, we, we need to do something about that. We need to look at it. And, and locally, my new district mate and I, Nader Hashim, uh, on December 16th at the Putney Library at 5 o'clock, uh, we're going to have the first in a series of uh, community conversations. We're going to have a presentation from Lieutenant Scott of the Vermont State Police on fair and impartial policing and implicit bias. And mm -hmm. I think it's important that we keep fostering uh, conversations that raise, raise the profile of this issue and, and what, what we can each do. Um, do you see that as work the legislature is going to be undertaking as well this year? So I have a lot of thoughts on that one and I'll yeah. see if I can say them in a relatively coherent fashion. Um, so there's, th I think there's two demographic issues. Uh, there's the aging population in Vermont um, relative you know, we're, we're not growing particularly and we're definitely growing older. Uh, and then there's the, um, the racial makeup, the diversity of our culture and, and our communities. And uh, I think that they're related actually. And I think that uh, there's pretty substantial challenges in both. Uh, so let me speak to the, the diversity question. And, and I went on Facebook after I heard about Kaya uh, and, and it's her Kaya Morris, yeah, from, Kaya Bennington. Morris from Bennington and, and her decision to step down from her seat. Um, and I wanted to make really clear that uh, she was dealing with an extremist, but that the, the conditions where an extremist can flourish persist in Vermont. And, um, and that we're not very skillful or experienced at, at grappling with uh, what it means to be a more diverse community, how we can get there, what it means uh, to have a real culture of inclusion. And, um, and I don't want to let all of us off the hook. So of course I think the legislature has a role, but we all have a role. Every institutional leader has a role in asking the question of how do we bring our organization into uh, a more diverse uh, state of being? How do we revisit and evaluate and train for the kind of inclusive practices and culture that we know will attract people? Um, 
you know, this is, so at, at every level of every part of Vermont institutions and, and community cultures, I think this is relevant and important and, and a challenge of our time. And part of the reason why it's a challenge of our time is to go back to this larger demographic issue of us being an aging state and one that isn't really growing. We do know, by the way, that actually the net migration of young people is positive, not negative, um, although that common perceived wisdom is that, you know, the 18 to 20 year old, 25 year olds are all leaving. Actually, more of them are coming in than leaving right now. Um, but where people are leaving is actually a little bit older in the 40 to 55 range. Um, but if you look nationally at where, uh, where the demographics are going nationally, we are becoming um, a much more diverse country. Uh, and, uh, and first generation, second generation immigrants are driving substantial innovation and energy in the economy all over the country. And the fact that we don't have a real culture of that here outside of Chittenden County, uh, outside of Burlington, really where they've had the refugee center for decades that's helped kind of create some energy, is actually, I, I think, hurting our economy. And it's certainly hurting our ability to be attractive to people uh, who might want to get, they might be, you know, they, their parents were immigrants, they've gone to college, they're starting a career and a life, you know, and maybe they want to get out of the city or get out of the suburbs and try something a little different. And they look at Vermont and they do see a place that maybe isn't as welcoming as we'd like to be, maybe isn't as culturally aware as we'd like it to be. And, and it becomes a burden uh, an extra barrier to to inclusion and and the kind of welcome that I think we we aspire to, but we always don't always deliver on. Yeah, it's a it's a huge concern, uh, and I look forward to to the challenge. Though mm -hmm. we've got some work to do, and and I, I feel like it's something that that we're up to and mm -hmm. recognizing it and moving forward. Uh, there's going to be a lot of other concerns uh, as we bring. Uh, this new session into into being and one of the things that we want to be clear about is people know how to get in touch with us because mm -hmm. we want to be uh, open to them and, and receptive and if you have ideas questions comments this is as good a time as any to get in touch with us and what's the best way to get in touch with you yeah so the there are a couple ways the traditional easy way is through the state's email system uh, and uh, if you search the legislature, you'll find all of us listed there. You can look by town, by district, by name, um, and my pu my information is all public there. Yeah. And that my email address is t t o l e n o t t o l e n o, and then at ledge dot state dot v t dot u s. So l e g dot v t sorry dot state dot v t dot u s. Yeah. Uh, my cell phone number is eight zero two five seven nine five five one one, and I'm actually quite friendly for texting as well. Yeah. Um, and it is my personal cell phone number, but uh, you know I I um, I do appreciate getting. Yeah feedback that way as well. But nothing after nine o'clock. Well, yeah, I'm a little bit of a night owl, but you know, yeah. yes, so normal normal rules <laughs> of, of decorum <laughs> for yeah. when to call people to apply. Well, there's, there's a lot for us to tackle. We could have talked about a lot more. Certainly there's the, the opioid crisis locally, a lot of concern mm. about Act 46 and how mm. votes were not respected by people and how do we move forward from that. And of course, there's uh, individual concerns that rise up and that's why we want to have mm -hmm. people be able to get in touch with us. So thank you for taking the time. Now. Thank you so much for hosting this conversation and, and uh, please be in touch to the citizens of Brattleboro and the Brattleboro area. You know, we, uh, we have a great delegation. We want to hear from you. We want to learn from you. Uh, we want to work for you, know, for you uh, in, in your government. You, be, you bet. And, and thanks to the people here at BCTV again. Uh, they do a great job uh, helping us bring our work building that bridge between Wyndham County and, and Montpelier so we can, in fact, uh, have a government by the people, for the people, and of the people. So um, until next time, take care now.